Real Country 550 and 92.9 WAME and W225BD Statesville. Selecting diamonds direct. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25 year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest from the racing world with their stories, their past, their, their racing, racing roots. Sponsored by Swimming Pool and Spa. Now, here's our host, David Ham. And good evening. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham, right here on WAME Radio and DHAM I Am on YouTube. And tonight, we're also streaming live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Twitch, which I don't ever go on Twitch. But anyway, we have on there for you. Which button? The live button. Yes, it is live. We are live already. Okay. So there you go. Sometimes uh, it doesn't always want to start. Yes, it doesn't always. Uh-huh. Hey, but we got Dave Lyle in with us. How you doing there, Mr. I'm Dave? Good. I'm good. Yourself? Doing great, man. That's good. Yes, sir. And I'm so happy to have you on the show. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time because I actually met you probably, I don't know, gosh, it's been Four six or five months. months ago, yeah, yeah. Six, six, eight months ago. Yep. Over at uh, our good buddy Chip's house. Uh huh. And Chip is in here with us as well. Chip is in the house, and he's going to be on the camera the whole show and on audio. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's a little bit camera shy. I never knew that about him. Is He likes to talk, so I never thought yeah. he would be camera shy. <laughs> right. I mean, who would have thought? <laughs> so, uh, but then we also got Bryson in here and Kristen Wilson. And uh, for the we first got a time. Full house. Don't telling. forget your lovely wife. Yes, and my wife, Tracy, who uh, coincidentally, her birthday is tomorrow. Yay. So thank you all for not letting me forget Happy that. Birthday, Tracy. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Behind every good man is a woman. There is you a, go. Is a, is a woman, yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sometimes there's a good woman behind yeah. a good man, but, you know. Ha, ha. Uh, anyway. And sometimes there's a great one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm putting the shovel down because I can tend to start digging a hole okay i'm not gonna do it today <laughs> <laughs> because we got bigger fish to fry That's because right. we got mr dave lyle in with us so your your biography is like way too long for me to say and your titles and all that kind of stuff i mean you've been involved with jack roush and uh lee iacocca and drag racing and a lot of people don't realize that nascar used to have a drag racing series uh-huh. as well and that's something i didn't know about until probably maybe 10 years ago i see yeah and, uh, nascar started out having uh, drag race as uh, one of their part of their speed weeks when they used to race in Daytona, they would have uh, drag races at the uh the land airport oh and uh they would have their big stars of the day like curtis turner uh the uh, local ford guy would bring his ford out and curtis would drive it hmm. and anyway uh one of the promoters from uh uh, well, the local tracks picked up and got a, uh, a license to go ahead and uh, form a drag race uh, a touring group. And I was part of that group in 1965, and I raced it all the way up until about 1969 when AHRA picked up the uh, NASCAR circuit. And HRA, AHRA, is, are they around anymore? Uh, no, I don't, the, I th- uh, their founder, uh, Jim Tice, passed away, and I think the organization folded after that. Okay. All right, and did uh, was it Fred Lorenzen? Was he another one? Yeah, Fred Lorenzen was another one. Uh, matter of fact, that's how Phil Biner got started uh, with Ford support. He prepared the car for uh, Fred Lorenzen to drive during the Speed Weeks drag racing. Okay, and of course, uh, Richard Petty. Uh, Richard Petty, right? All of them. Because uh, Fireball Roberts. So uh, anyway. <clears throat> Uh, when I first started drag racing, it was just for trophies and uh, <clears throat> the expense of, there was no way to recover the expense of uh, maintaining your car, uh, except maybe match racing. So we started match racing in 1961. And uh, when uh, NASCAR got it, when I found out about the NASCAR drag race division, that was the first time we really started seriously racing for money. Uh, back in 1965, NASCAR would pay $100 a round. Hmm. So if you qualify for the show, you're guaranteed to make at least a hundred. <laughs> now that's like a thousand dollars spending power today. So oh. that was big money. Okay, good. And uh, we'd race Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday usually on the weekends, and uh, come home Monday sometimes with two or three thousand dollars. Wow, that's that's good money. Yeah, back like then. twenty, thirty grand today. Yeah, 
So what would the, the hundred dollars buy you in racing terms back then? A set of tires? Uh, buy a set of tires or buy a transmission. It would buy uh, it would buy uh, twenty gallons of gas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, more than that, gas was only twenty five cents a gallon, so it would oh. buy uh, uh, what four hundred gallons. Okay. Um, hundred dollars uh, would pay a month's rent on an apartment. <laughs> hmm. uh, buy a two weeks, three weeks worth of groceries or longer. <laughs> Yeah, it bought by you uh, five thousand dollars to buy you a house, wouldn't it? Yeah, right. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, the house I was born, my dad bought it in nineteen thirty six for twenty twenty six hundred dollars. All right, man. So how do you, how do you get those? So what happened with all this? I mean, the the money and all that. You know, now it's like everybody's trying to get money and you can't find any anywhere. Well, uh, I had sponsorship uh, starting in nineteen sixty seven. Mm -hmm. uh, from the Ford dealer I used to work for, Bob Ford Incorporated in uh, Dearborn, um, I drove their cars in 1962 and 1963 as uh, factory-sponsored. Well, even going back before that, starting in 1958, one of their salesmen by the name of Jack Gray, we used to race as demonstrators. I was racing my street car at the time and uh, met Jack at the drag strip. And uh, Jack saw that my family was just getting started, so he said, "Why don't you sell your street car and uh, and uh, come to work and just be the crew guy in my race car?" So that's how I got really started and hooked up with Bob Ford. And uh, of course, Jack was well connected with the people at Ford, and he introduced me to a lot of the people like uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Mr. Holman from Holman Moody and uh, a lot of the Ford brass, uh, Charlie Gray and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, things just took off from there. Uh, Jack was a mentor of mine. And uh, <clears throat> I really started looking at drag racing more as a business, you know, mm -hmm. how much you could win and what it would cost to run. And uh, so from 1962 uh, onward, why I was connected with the Bob Ford organization. And we had factory support from Ford. And then in 63, at the tail end of the 63 season, I went to work for Ford directly in their engineering center. And uh, I started my own team. So I was on my own from 1963 onward uh, until 1971, which I retired from professional racing uh, and went back to uh, just amateur uh, or sportsman racing after 1971. So those those Mustangs you drove, what was the most popular year model? And they were fastbacks too, right? Right. I think my 69 was probably the most popular one. Uh, I named it after the Ford tagline in a commercial, the going thing. And I started out with a 69 Cobra Jet that I'd gotten from Ford for a dollar oh. and uh, stripped it down and put plexiglass windows in it and took all the sealer and sound dender out of it and so forth. And I re reworked the spring tower so I could put a bigger motor in like a, a single overhead cam that Ford had at the time down the road. But I started out with just a tunnel port, uh, which I had left over from my 68 Mustang. And uh, went to the Ford test track and they were testing the uh, cars that uh, Holman Moody Strop had built for uh, the Ford drag team. And they were running like 1050s on the Ford quarter mile that they had set up at the test track. I rolled my tunnel port 69 off the trailer, ran 1020, first shot out of the box. Mm. So uh, I knew we were on to something. Anyway, I went on to the Spring Nationals, and uh, that's when I set the first nine second run, uh, recorded at a national meet. And then the following week, I went to uh, Evansville, Indiana. They had a big, uh, what we would call pro stock later, but at, at the time it was just heads up super stock. And I, I won that show, and they protested me because I, I was a tenth faster than the rest of the field. So uh, <laughs> it was a funny story. I asked him, well, what does that mean, being protested? Well, I don't race with the crew, with the rest of them. I just make single runs. So the two pair would run down, and then I'd make a single. So <laughs> I, I was pretty sure I had everybody covered. So what I did, they'd go out and, and run two at a time until they worked their way through the field, and I'd go up and just grab them down the track to save wear and tear in my car. Oh, yeah. And then when it come down to the final, uh, their, their winner was uh, uh, the chassis builder. Uh, uh, 
on a, a uh, St. Louis. Anyway, uh, he won the show with the Chevy, and then I had to race him for the final. So that was my first or my second wide open run, and I beat him. And then uh, they did the teardown, and of course I let him do the run the micrometers and everything to check, make sure I was not too big of an engine and legal on weight and fuel. Anyway, I got the money going home with only making two wide open throttle runs. Wow, yeah. That's so good. that's an that insult to injury. Yeah. There's a lot of videos. I went and did some searching on there. You punch in Dave Lyle on the on YouTubes, and you can find videos. And you also see a lot of it with Ronnie Sox. Right. Yeah, Ronnie was a good friend of mine. I got to meet him uh, when I started touring with the NASCAR, and uh, I, I liked Ronnie a lot. Mm -hmm. Did you get to ever get to race against Richard Petty, I know he wasn't in it very long. No, he was back out of it when I started uh, okay. touring. Okay. I never raced with him. Yeah. Because I know I, his deal was sort of a, whenever the uh, was it Chrysler was boycotting NASCAR. Right. In a way. Yeah. And they still went racing, and they did the drag racing thing. Right. Uh-huh. Tim and Morris and uh, and uh, Dale Inman. Right. Dale Inman, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I did race against, uh, you know, like, Grumpy Jenkins and... Uh, all the other top stars of the day during my tour, during my uh, time of being a professional, but mm -hmm. I never did race uh, uh, Richard Petty. Okay. Well, I was just curious about that because uh, I know that a lot of people don't realize that he, Richard Petty raced in that NASCAR drag racing right. series, uh -huh. and, and then he ended up uh, getting in, had an accident, whatever. Right. And, and some people got killed, and that was another story. But yeah. um, hold on one second. Oh, put your headphones on. Okay. Yeah. In that NASCAR drag race right here. All right. Hey, caller. Uh, getting in, had an accident, whatever. Right. Uh, hey, can you turn that down a little bit? Because it's hard for us to hear. All right. There you go. Hey there, caller. Who we got on the line with us? Oh, put your headphones on. Okay. You got uh, somebody okay. stepping from behind the curtain here. All right. Hey, caller. Okay. Somebody's... Now, who would be calling in but from behind the curtain? It's hard for us to hear. Right. Okay. Go. Well, caller, who we got? all right, then. Hey, so call back because I'm not sure what's going on there. Anyway, we are expecting a call, but I'm okay. just going to wait and see. All right. So that's what I was thinking that was. But for some reason, it wasn't, yeah, I don't uh -huh. know, picking up feedback and that kind of thing. But, yeah, just give us a call back, and we'll see. So I did have a comment on, we actually had a message on my uh, website. And it was from Pat Lyle, and she had said, I'll have to go find that. But she basically said that that write-up that you did, the thing you sent me and I posted on the website, she said you did really good with that. And then she said, XO, you know her? It's Pat Lyle, Patricia. Oh, my sister. Okay. Yeah. Well, she had <laughs> yeah. a different last name, too. Uh -huh. I just didn't write it down in oh. my... Well, her uh, uh, married name was Hill. Uh, Pat, Hill. She goes by Pat Lyle Hill. Okay. She's a widow, though, because her husband passed away a few years back. Mm -hmm. She and was my is, alternate mother. There is another question that came through. Dickie Dennis says, why did Ronnie Socks have the Batman logo in the center of his car grill? It wasn't Ronnie Socks. That was Al Joniak. Okay. That was Al Joniak. Okay. Another, Al Zoniak. another Ford buddy of mine. Okay. All right. Hey there, caller. There is another question that came through. Dickie Dennis says, have the all right i'm not sure why it's doing that i don't think we're okay so whoever's calling needs to turn the radio off yeah that's it it almost sounds like you're calling from in the studio but it's all right now maybe they're there this is, hey. this, this is jack roush oh hey jack roush you got me yes sir we got you now there we go hey Hi, dave jack. how are you doing i'm doing good jack good to hear your voice i i'm they uh, uh they asked they asked me if I'd uh, call in here, and uh, <laughs> they wanted to maybe get, get the, uh, the the water board and the, the, the light bulb that goes back and forth and the, the drip on the you know, center of your forehead. They want, they want some shoes on. <laughs> Interrogation. Yeah, I was looking for a plug. To, uh, looking for an opportunity to plug you, Jack, so uh, I'm yes. glad you called. This is good. Yeah. You know, I, I read your I read your 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 uh, biography there, and uh, there's a lot about you I did not understand. If I if I understood what, what you did and what you were capable of, I'd been a little nicer to you. <laughs> <laughs> you might still be working there, <laughs> even right? 
Uh, that's Dave, good. Dave was in charge of all of our purchase, all of our, our all of our sales, and the project manager on the big projects. The first uh, fifteen years, I was in business on every virtually every big job. I bet the company, and, and Dave was right there to to, to pull my my, uh, my feet out of the fire. <laughs> That was the greatest time of my life, Jack. I, first time I ever had anybody that shared my dream, and you gave me the resources to run with it, and uh, I had the time of my life. I want to thank you for that, and uh, it was great to work with you, and uh, <clears throat> the, the success that you've obtained, you certainly earned. The, uh, you know, the one thing that was clear to me, I came off a farm in southern Ohio, and I had no uh, no uh, uh, experience with the, the latest engines or the, the, the newest uh, technologies that was available to you in, in south, southeast Michigan. But I uh, I worked at junkyards and uh, put uh, big engines in little cars and uh, did things like that and, and then always sold my cars to make money for the next one. Well, our careers aren't that far apart because I spent my time in junkyards too, Jack. When I was a teenager, me and my buddies, that's how we'd make a hot rod. We'd get an old Ford Flathead and put an Olds or Cadillac or Chrysler engine in it and I had instant hot rod. <laughs> and I could only do it for just a couple hundred dollars, so that was the way to go. Hey. The car that I drove to, to Michigan was a 54 Dodge with a 57 Dodge uh, Super Red Ram engine in it. Uh-huh. And uh, I paid twenty-five dollars for the engine with a broken crankshaft, and seventy-five dollars for the body with a blown-up engine. <laughs> and I had something, I had something to go one hundred and fifty mile an hour. Wow! Yeah, these guys that write a check to to go win a race today, they don't know what we went through back in the days, but we sure had our fun, and we sure learned. <laughs> hey, Jack, what was the story with the? There's a picture of you and Dave with Lee Iacocca. Well, when uh, when Chrysler bought out uh, American Motors, they they bought a, a, a plant in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that was making a uh, rear-wheel drive car. And Chrysler wanted a front-wheel drive car, and they decided that they were going to take the floor fan and the tooling that they had for the rear-wheel rear drive Eagle and make a front-wheel drive uh, uh, Chrysler out of it. And they uh, convinced the purchasing people in Icoca that we could do that, and it was a lie to start with because we had know nothing about how to do that. But, but we uh, we worked hard enough to win the lie the truth, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, that's great. I remember what Jack used to tell me when we'd go to the sales meetings. He said, Don't worry about the boat. You just grab the fish in the boat. We'll cut it up. <laughs> uh, Our friends that. on you. Know, one thing became one thing became clear to me as I read your, your biography. You know, Wayne Gap made a mistake when he made a partnership with me. He should have made it with you. Well, he did make it with me. I, Wayne and I were partners for a little bit of time, but uh, there were some things about uh, the way uh, Wayne treated people that I just couldn't agree with, so uh, I stepped aside. Um, but I wish Wayne luck. I mean, we remain friends. He just, I just want to be partners with him. The, f the first winter we were together was uh, 70, uh, 70 or 71, I think it was 70. We were together, I bought uh, two junkyard, two uh, wrecked cars out of the Detroit News. At that time, you didn't have to declare if a car had a wreck right. uh, to sell it as a used car. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I bought those, those junk cars, or wrecked cars, in the, sh in the, in the uh, shop that Wayne had in Dearborn that we were working out of, and he, I thought he was going to throw me and the cars both out. <laughs> he didn't want that <laughs> Well, we did. We did what we had to do back in those days. Tracy, what were you going to say? I said, our YouTube friends are calling Jack the Cat in the Hat. Is that your nickname? The Cat in the Hat? Yeah, Benny Parsons did that to me. I, I was actually at the Detroit Grand Prix, and I had uh, two or three cars running in the, uh, in the. Uh, they had a Formula One race there, but we had a Trans Am race as a as a uh, preliminary race to it. And uh, I had two or three sponsors on uh, different sponsors on the cars. They all had their box of hats, and uh, I looked at my secretary and I says, I was looking in the shadow of the rinse in there. 
I said, go up in the towers and see if you can find a, a men's uh, dress dress clothes uh, store. And I said, find me a, a, a hat I'd wear to church on Sunday. I said, I want a gentleman's uh, straw hat. And she brought the, the seagrass fedora down, <laughs> and that was my hat. I, I said, I, I, I'll, I'll wear your decal on my shirt, but my uh, my head's my own. Uh, my own <laughs> there um, you go. That's right. You built that brand. Uh, we just about got Tom Gant up here this evening, but he was busy. So Tom Gant lives across the street from Chip Minnick. And yes. Then, and then uh, Dave goes over there. Uh, back in the early days uh, when uh, Jack and asked me to uh, make the dynamometer department a commercial venture, um, I hired, started hiring people and started building test cells. And uh, we had an ad in the paper, and Tom Gant come walking in one day looking to fill the ad. And as soon as I talked to Tom, I saw that glint in his eye and the desire. And uh, I said, we just got to hire this guy. They, they got to fire me if I don't hire him. <laughs> this, this is the man. Yeah. Sure enough, he went on to run the engine department and, uh, and be Jack's uh, part of Roush Yates Racing. So, uh, and Tom and I are, are, are great friends and are great friends today. And I think the great of um, because in my life, I found several people who mentored me and uh, gave me the opportunity. And they saw the glit in my eye and the fire in my belly, and uh, they give me a chance. And, uh, and that's what I've spent through my life, identifying people that had that and uh, giving them the opportunity to let them run with their talents. That's basically the opportunity that Jack gave me. Mm-hmm. You put the foundation under this thing that made it strong. Greatest adventure of my life, Jack. I want to thank you again. You know, you wouldn't remember this, I, I don't think, but about 1962 uh, uh, or 63, you were operating a speed shop out of your garage. Yes. And I was racing uh, 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 stock and super stock cars with a group called the Fast Facts. Yeah, I remember that. And I'd come down and you... You'd sell me the discounted uh, crane and uh, and Moroso and uh, other things you had in your speed shop that I needed, but I ran my ra- ran race cars uh, except for the production parts uh, with all the aftermarket stuff I got. I ran it out of your garage. Uh huh. Very good. Uh, yeah, those uh, custom speed enterprise people were uh, really a, a great part of my early professional career. Without their help, I, I'd have never made it to the big time. Back in those days, uh, they paid me twenty-five hundred dollars a car. So in 1960, 1967, uh, I got thousand uh, dollars worth of parts and five hundred dollars in uh, cash to put their name on my '67 Fairlane. And I had Bob Ford on the back, so I put Custom Speed Enterprise in the front fender. And the following year, when I told them I was going to get one of the lightweight Cobra Jets, why they wanted the whole car. So the most ridiculous number I could think of was $2,500, and they agreed to that. And uh, <laughs> then the next year we doubled it to 5000 So Sure. Yeah. That, that gave me the foundation I needed to do the traveling and pay my, pay my own expenses. I got free parts from Ford. For, I got a Holman Moody Charge account and uh, bought dollar cars, but I still had to pay my own machine shop bill and and uh, parts that I couldn't get from Holman Moody I still had to buy. So. Uh, the sponsors were very essential to our, our early success. I went, uh, I went to the SEMA show the last year. It was in Anaheim, California. And uh, I, I, we had won, Wayne had won the AHR championship in 1972. And we were going to run the Tom Smith uh, NHRA car in 73. So I told him, I says, uh, all the Marussos and the, the Lions and the Hollies and uh, hooker headers and everybody else that was there. I told him, I says, we won the HRA Pro Stock Championship in 72 and we're going to win the NHRA in 73. In 73, I built 12 engines for my Pro Stock cars. We uh, never blown up a part, uh, an engine all year. Uh, I had no engines left. And uh, we'd run a race and I would sell the engine to the highest bidder. When we, uh, when we before I took the car home, so I brought the car home twelve times with no engine in it, and uh, and uh, I, uh, they gave me a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars worth of product sponsors, and I bought a half a million dollars worth of parts from the same people that gave me the hundred twenty-five. So 
I was I was selling my cars like I had my own junkyard cars to build the next. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, people ask me, uh, why are you always building a race car? I said, well, uh, once you start racing professionally, one is never enough. So you're always uh, fixing one, building another one, and selling one. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Cratchity has a question. All right. He wants to know if either Dave or Jack knows, let's see, remembers a Roush employee named Mike Clarahan. He was an engine builder. Yes. Mike is still a friend of mine today, and uh, uh, I don't remember if I hired Mike or not, but uh, he was a very uh, fabric, a very talented fabricator. Uh, he's gifted with uh, working in aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I still follow him on Facebook today. Yes, I remember him very well. Very yeah. good. That was Will Cronkright asking that question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cratchity as he is on, on mm -hmm. YouTube. Yeah. Well, uh, Jack, I still have that uh, Gap and Roush parts catalog that I showed you years ago and, and some of those decals, and I got you to sign my, my decal. But the parts catalog, I, I, I wish I could buy those parts for that price nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, you know. That would be great. You know, Ford, Ford backed away from racing and, and uh, selling performance in their cars in 1971. And uh, from 71 to 79, they had no interest at all in performance cars. And anybody younger than 50 years old that had any kind of an interest in performance wouldn't even be caught dead in the Ford dealership. So they decided that they were going to they decided they were going to do something about it. So they came to me and asked me if I'd build an engine, build cars for the uh, pace cars for the Daytona five for the Indy 500. And I came back and talked to the, the guys, and including Dave, and asked them if they thought we could do that, do it right. And, and everybody said we should bet the company. Let's do it. So, so we we uh, we, we built the pace cars. I still got to uh, built three pace cars. I still got two of them in my personal collection. I, I collected them after Ford stopped using them for for uh, displays, and. Uh, I, uh, I had my parts catalog. They, they wanted to start selling parts, and they asked me if I'd help them put together a, a parts catalog. And I said, well, the first thing I'll do is give you this one, which was an embarrassment. It didn't have any professional printing. It was just, uh, just copy machine uh, sheets, paper. And uh, the, there was a time when, uh, in the, in the uh, early 70s, when all the Ford or NASCAR teams were complaining that they couldn't get good blocks, the Cleveland blocks had bad cylinder walls and they would crack, and you couldn't hardly finish the race with one. And uh, a, a, a guy that had been the vice president of uh, Ford Transmissions I was retired. Uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. But uh, Don Tope. Don, Don Tope had an association with uh, all the upper management. He was the head of TNC. And so he made a deal with uh, the, the same people that sold the marine engines to the marine industry. He made a deal with uh, those those uh, Ford people that were used to selling stuff uh, out of dealerships that way, around dealerships. And so we went to the bank and borrowed a couple hundred thousand dollars of uh, the, the, uh, the Woodses and the Bud Moores and everybody else that wanted to race Fords put their money in. And we got uh, we got blocks that uh, you would, would last. And kept and kept it going. Hmm. Wow, that's a great story. That's a behind the scenes something that not, not a lot of people knew about. Yeah, for sure. Well, I was fortunate enough I got to see the the development yeah. of the FR9 because <clears throat> I was there from uh -huh. 2004 right till I left in 2018. So uh -huh. 14 years with Ralph and Yates. Actually, uh, Ford pulling out of racing in '71 is the reason I didn't go professional because mm. the year before I had uh, I had burned up all my free. Uh, Pit help my volunteer crew. Mm -hmm. I was getting uh, cars for a dollar from Ford and all the parts I needed from home and Moody. And when Ford pulled out of racing, I thought, well, I'm just barely making it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Ford pulls back to support, there's no way I'm going to make a living doing this. So I, I, I had planned on quitting Ford and going full time like my buddy uh, Bob Glidden did and Don Nicholson. So. I uh, I lost my nerve and I I did I sold all my race car stuff and bought two gas stations, which uh, changed the course of my life dramatically. <laughs> uh, one of the coolest pictures I saw was the Jack Roush and Wayne Gap in the background while you're drag racing. 
Yeah, Cars right. Taken yeah, out. that's my pinot at uh, Nationals, 1973. Um, a friend of mine who was my crew chief back when I was racing uh, pro stock, Clyde Dietrich, him and I went together and built a pinot. It was a home-built car, had a rectangular tube frame and basically a stock front suspension and uh, uh, some parts we had left over from my pro stock and we built a 351 Cleveland and we had the problem that Jack talks about the store bought in blocks that we get from the dealer weren't strong enough and uh, even at Bornham 30 over every uh, couple of weeks we'd uh, end up cracking a block and have to put the sleeve in it and uh, anyway <clears throat> we're trying to qualify for Indy which we did in 73 and one of the pictures of uh, me leaving the starting line and Jack and Al Buckmaster are in the background watching me Mm. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Yes, it is. Well, Jack, do you have any more stories about Dave? Any, anything you can tell us on the radio? <laughs> Don't <laughs> tell him about wrecking all them cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So working for Jack for so many I, I years, did. he's got so I many came, stories. I came, same, I came to the same conclusion that Dave did about me. Jack. I didn't think that I wanted to be his partner forever either. <laughs> And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, hey, Jack, thanks. Uh, Go ahead. There's one thing I'd like to say Dave, Dave was on a good trajectory with his Tunnel Port engine. His Tunnel Port uh, 427 engines with the NASCAR parts he was able to get from home to Moody was a class of the field. They were yeah. better than anything the Ford, uh, the Ford was doing in their engineering, and they were better than anything that independents were doing on the outside. So, when he made your t when he made his turn toward the Boss 429, is when he, he really cut off his yeah. his potential going forward. When I took the uh, the tunnel port out and put the Boss 429 in, I ruined a perfectly good race car. It took a year and thousands of dollars of work to get that Boss 429 to run the same ETs and same mile an hour. I was getting with the Holman Moody engine, and the Holman Moody engine was a lot lighter, a lot cheaper to build, and uh, a lot more durable. So it was a a terrible decision, and if I had my left foot of over again, that's one decision I would do different. If I'd have spent that year uh, and all that money that I did on the on the Boss Fruit Front 29, if I'd have spent that on the tunnel port, uh, the history books and pro stock would look different today, I'm sure. Thank you, Jack, for that compliment. Hey, Jack. Hey, thanks. Uh, I wanted to tell you, too, while I had you on the phone, thanks for all the, the many years that we had uh, racing together and the pasta, the pasta meals and the cheesecakes. <laughs> Where, yes. I think I gained a lot of weight through those years, but we won a lot of races, you know, Carl Edwards and Matt Kenseth and Greg Biffle. And, uh, man, we got pasta and cheesecake every time we won. That's a, that's a strange coincidence. I gained a lot of weight working with Jack, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that, one thing's for sure. We'd always get, get lined up and get ready to yeah. go eat, and then Jack would start telling stories. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and get him and Robert Yates telling stories together. It's priceless, though. I, I used to have parties at my house twice a year where we invite the Ford Brass and, uh, and uh, some of our customers, and I'd get Jack and his wife and a couple of the other people from our company and uh, I would try to get a couple of drinks in Jack to, so I could get him to tell, start telling some stories because he would be the hit of the night oh, yes. <laughs> once he would t start telling the stories about growing up on a farm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the, <clears throat> the one I liked the best was the, uh, the dog hunting the chickens. <laughs> what about I, I won't tell him. I, I'll, I'll let Jack tell him if he wants to tell it. I won't tell him. <laughs> What about that one, Jack? The dog hunting and chickens. I think Jeff, he might have left the room. Yeah. Okay. He might have left the room. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. Hey, um, well, anyway, he might have, maybe he lost his signal or lost yeah. whatever. Okay. But yeah, I think he was listening to us whenever he called in the first couple of times. That's where we were getting that feedback. Oh, all right. And uh, so if we, it looks like we lost you there, Jack. Thanks so much for calling. And, uh, we uh, appreciate all that you've done for us through the years and, and for all the race fans. I mean, my gosh, so many legendary yeah, stories. I, I want and, to thank him for the, what he's done for me in my career, too. Shoot, yeah. And the opportunities that he's given me to really uh, run with my dream. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to Racing Roots with Ham and Dave Lyle.
Diamonds directly from the world's most renowned master diamond cutters, accessing tens of thousands. Shop Johnson's Automotive, 1112 Shelton Avenue, Statesville. Real Country, 550 and 92.9 WAME. And we're back to Racing Roots with Ham. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you're listening on the radio, 92.9 FM, 550 AM, you can also see us here live in the Randy Marine Studio on DHAM I Am on the YouTube channel. And you can... I think what we were streaming, we are streaming over on Facebook and all the other several Facebook pages and stuff as well. But if you want the closer up camera angles and the better quality and all that, go to my YouTube channel because that are monitored. That what now? The questions are monitored. Yeah, the, the, yeah. So and Bryson's got monitoring over there. Bryson, what mic are you on? Three. I'm on number two. On number two. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. There you go. So I was thinking we had a, a mic over here for Chip, too. But I think he said he didn't want to talk. He don't even want to be on camera. So. He's going to play the, behind the curtain. Yeah, the man behind the curtain. <laughs> there he is. That's Mr. Chip. I never knew Chip to be uh, shy. Be shy. <laughs> so like I said, Dave is the star. I'm just here. I'm the audience. Yeah. So. Chip, Chip's the man behind the curtain. He is the man behind the curtain. <laughs> so you're playing talking about the fan today. Yeah. All right. So, yes, he's... Uh, very good. So if you have any questions over there, Bryson, you can go ahead and shout them out if you'd like. You don't have any questions yet? I've got two on YouTube. Okay, go okay, for it. Yeah. You ready? Well, I just Becky Courtney says hello, and that's the all the conversation we have over here, but hopefully hello. we'll get that going pretty well, quickly. Hey, Becky Courtney. So, yeah, Thanks we want to say hey in. to her. Yeah. You're on mic number three, by the way. Yes. Okay. All right. So <laughs> Brian Cynical says, I am originally from Jersey. Ask Mr. Lyle about Old Bridge English Town Raceway Park, if he ever had set or won any national events there. Uh, the one time it, I won an event at, uh, at uh, English Town was uh, back we were racing the, the uh, Pro 5 old Mustang with Storm and Norman. Uh, there was a big rivalry between the Pro 5 old Mustang and the Buick Grand National. So uh, Norm, Storm and Norman got this uh, deal going on where we would do a challenge. It was called a war to settle the score. So we went to English Town with the uh, Pro 5 Mustang and the best Pro 5 Mustangs and the best uh, Buick Grand Nationals in the country. We met there for uh, eliminations and uh, I ended up winning it with uh, Storm and Norman's car. Uh, so that was the, uh, the one time that I won something big at English Town. So, Seems like that name sounds familiar, Storm and Norman. Yeah, there was yeah. Storm and Norman, uh, the general that in the uh, Desert Storm War. Norman Schwarzkopf. Yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. who I remember. But this was Norm Gray. He ran a Pro 5 on Mustang, which we built the engines and uh, cars that Roush for. Was he tough to work with? Storm and Norman? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he was very tough to work with. Okay. Matter of fact, uh, after two years, I had to give it up. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I'd seen that in your biography deal, but I also wondered why they called him Storm and Norman. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I thought maybe it was something to do with his uh, uh, temper. No, that's, or, that's a good name for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it fit, huh? Well, we'll see. It makes sense. Uh, All right. I'll just let it go at that. 
Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> nice. Is he still around? No, he passed away uh, several years back. Yeah. Okay. All right, Tracy, what else you got? All right. So Bill Lowe says, can he tell us about Bob Ford car dealership and short-lived Ford 406 engine? What was the last part of the question? Um, short-lived 406 engine. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, Bob Ford was the name of the dealer's principal. In other words, a lot of dealers named their, their dealership after themselves. The dealer principal was Robert Ford. He was a cousin of Henry Ford, and he started the dealership back in the 20s in Dearborn. So he called it Bob Ford. That was his name. And uh, I went to work for him in 1962. Uh, originally, as I talked earlier, I had met the salesman from Bob Ford, Jack Gray, uh, in 1958 when he was racing his demonstrator. Every year he would order the lightest body with the biggest engine that Ford had, and he would letter it up with the shoe polish, you know, see Jack mm -hmm. Gray at Bob Ford, and uh, take his uh, demonstrator to the races and pass his business cards out. And uh, he sold a lot of cars uh, that way. And then uh, we got to be uh, really good friends in 1958, 1959. In 1959, I sold my own race car and, and devoted myself just to working on his car. Of course, by 1960, uh, it was a professionally painted lettered car with a 352 cubic inch, uh, 360 horsepower engine. And uh, in 61, uh, we had enough Ford support that Ford sent our car down to Holman Moody and had a Holman Moody blueprint it and uh, put some special rear end parts in it. And uh, also it was professionally lettered. And uh, then by 62, uh, Paul Harvey came uh, to Detroit to be the general manager of Bob Ford. He was from Indianapolis. So uh, we took his demonstrator <laughs> and just put the body on Jack 61 uh, so we could have an instant race car because the, the bodies on the 61 and the 62 were basically basically the same. And uh, we raced uh, uh, Paul Harvey 62, and then uh, we took the 406 and got a NASCAR side-bolted block. And... Uh, Ford at the time thought that uh, 406 was the biggest bore they could do. I think it was 4130, four inch 130 thousandths, because the people at Engine Foundry didn't think that they had enough casting left in the FE block uh, to go uh, four and a quarter bore. So uh, at the time, all they had to compete with was the 409 Chevy, the 413 Mopar, and the 421 Pontiac. Uh, so they, they, uh, they, uh, thought they'd leave it at 406. Of course, the following year, they had to step up because everybody was going to 426 and 427 on the Chevy, so they had to take the Ford, uh, change their casting techniques so they could take it out to 4.24 4 and change bore. So the 406 was a one year only because uh, at the time they thought that was big enough, all the bigger they needed to go, and they were bumping up against the limits of the FE block. Well, good answer. Yeah, that's a very thorough answer. It's great. Uh, that's stuff that, that it fascinates me because, you know, it's it's funny how you you see this stuff back in the day, uh -huh. and then it evolves into we get a new block, a new engine, you know, the D three, the C three, the yeah. FR nine, right? And then you kind of run into some of the same problems because a lot of times you're running into guys that had that are just maybe some engineers that are just now getting into racing. And they're just now seeing this stuff for the first time. Right. That's where people like you with all that experience can say, well, you know what? We had this same problem back in the 60s or the 70s. Right. right. And then you come up with the solutions. It's like, man. One of Ford's successes, uh, one of the persons attributable to Ford's success in the 60s was our, an engineer by the name of Don Sullivan, who had been at Ford since the 30s when they were racing the flatheads at Indy, when uh, Henry Ford actually was active in, in racing. Mm. So he was around then and, and all the way up into the 50s and 60s, and uh, he helped design a camshaft that I was very fond of in the in the late 60s. And he worked for SVO, uh, a Ford, uh, Ford uh, Racing after he retired from Ford uh, for several more years. So uh, he, that, that's a good example of an old guy that brought us talent, you know, mm. generations ahead. Yeah, for sure. Do you have you heard the name of uh, Bill Blair, Bill Blair Senior? Yes. Uh -huh. He NASCAR, won. Yeah. Yes, that's right. He won the Daytona 
Beach Road Course in 1953. Right. And right. Uh, his son's a good friend of ours, and he's been on the show, Bill Blair Jr. Yeah. But he's a, he's a big flathead Ford man, uh-huh. too. He grew up around them, of course. <laughs> that was Chip my was first engine Chip. build was Chip. a Ford F-Flathead. You got a mic? Okay, we're going to get Chip on the mic here. Here we go. Let me get him on the camera, too. Hold on. What the 406 turned into eventually, that block bore size. Yeah, the 428. The 428. Yeah, the 406 block turned into the 428 by adding a more stroke to the crank. Okay. The 427 has basically a three and three quarter inch uh, stroke, and uh, the 428 is just under four inches. So they they stroked the 406 and made it a 428 because <clears throat> the uh, scrap rate on doing the 427 blocks was so high. They could do the 406 block with the 4130 bore. They could salvage a lot more blocks. Mm-hmm. So uh, by putting a bigger crank in, they got a higher torque, mm-hmm. a cheaper race engine. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And then Tracy's like, what? No, I get it. <laughs> yes. You know, like putting a three, 350 block and a 400 crank and it's yeah. a 383 kind of deal. Yeah. Stroking it. It's all mm-hmm. mathematics. Math. Right. Mm-hmm. What kind of sort of, yeah. Mm-hmm. What it comes down to. And speaking of mathematics, did you get an engineering degree? We didn't, we didn't really start from the way yeah, back. Yeah, I was going to say, we kind of jumped all over the place. His first race car was a wagon. A wagon? Yeah. Like well, a covered wagon wagon? Or? No, a, what do you call those? <laughs> a Mercury uh, wagon. That's right. Pedal, pedal powered. There you go. <laughs> yes. And there's a picture of me somewhere with my first race car. It was a Mercury, you know, a little uh, red wagon. Yes. Literally a little red wagon that... Uh, I think I got for my fifth or sixth birthday. It's on racingroots.com now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so people can go in there and see it. Yeah, right. So uh, so my first race car was a Ford. It was a Mercury. <laughs> That's cool. So, so where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town called East Detroit, Michigan. It's uh, just north of the city limits of Detroit. It's since changed their name to East Point. Uh, when I... Uh, lived there it was two square miles it went from eight mile road to ten mile road and from kelly road to beaconsfield so it was two miles each direction uh it was mostly uh immigrants uh from uh, world war one and w- world war two and returning gis and uh my dad was a real estate salesman and uh he sold real estate in that town and uh <clears throat> i grew up uh Half a mile from Motor City Speedway. I take that back. I was a mile and a half from Motor City Speedway, which was a quarter mile high bank uh, oil clay track at Eight Mile and Shaner, which I spent much of my misspent youth there. <laughs> <laughs> Loving the every minute bug. of it. Yeah. Where I grew to love the smell of methanol and castor oil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool. Uh, yeah. So that's how you kind of got involved with the Fords and stuff. Well, uh, there was a gas station in town that was right near my house, a golf gas station that was a full-service station. They also had the police towing and a AAA uh, contract for AAA towing. Mm -hmm. So I used to hang around there when I was a kid, and uh, I was building a little gasoline-powered go-kart. My dad had bought me a Briggs & Stratton engine, so I'd leave the lawn tractor alone. (laughs) And uh, our next-door neighbor was an electrician. So I got him to bend me up some tubing, and I built a replica of the track roadsters that ran at Motor City Speedway. So I had uh, had a paper route then, and I would save, I would make $15 a week on my paper route. The flat rate at Campbell's Golf was $5 an hour. So I would pay the old man, I was, on Saturday morning, I'd pay him $5 for an hour worth of welding. Of course, he'd give me an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes. And I used to watch him, you know, and put the extra glasses on and see how he did it. So one day we'd got all done, he's shutting the torch off and he says to me, anything else I can do for you? I said, uh, Grant, can I borrow the torch? <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and he said, uh, think you can light it? I said, I think so, I was watching how you do it. So he handed it to me, he said, show me. So I set the oxygen, set the acetylene, hit the striker and lit the torch, got a nice hot flame, handed it back to him, he looked at it, he handed it back to me, he says, don't burn yourself. Ah, well, from cool. that time on, I had to run of the place. I mean, it was like I was their adopted son. You proved yourself. Yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was very instrumental in my racing career. Anyway, uh, Campbell's also ran a hardtop, which was a 39 Ford at Motor City Speedway. So uh, I would be part of the crew uh, 
when they bring it back, I'd help hammer the dents out and wash parts when they change engines and so forth. And then as I got a little older, why, they would take me along as a crew. Matter of fact, uh, talking about history, I went with them the first night they raced at Flat Rock Speedway in 1953. That's one of the only short tracks that's still racing in Detroit, in the Detroit area. Quarter mile asphalt oval. Mm. Now, how old were you when you started going to this gas station and hanging out? Well, I started hanging out there when I was 11 or 12, and uh, I got my paper out when I was 13, I believe. So that was 13 when I learned how to weld, and uh, um, I went to work there. I was a little too young, probably 15, and I worked there up until I was 19 as a mechanic. Uh, and I went from there to Crusader Marine Engines, so... Um, I spent much of my youth there. <clears throat> that was a, once again I had mentioned uh, people mentoring you or taking you in, and they mm -hmm. seemed to have a certain talent or something. And I wanted to thank the Campbell family uh, who ran the Gulf Station uh, for doing that for me by you know uh, making me like an adopted son and giving me the run of the place. And matter of fact, when I got older and had my own car, he used to sponsor me at the drag races. Very nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice. Well, like I said, you had to prove yourself. So. That's right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You yep. got very far with it. I'm sure they're very proud of you. They're I'm sure they were. Proud. Matter of fact, last message I got from the Campbell family was how proud they were of me. Very well. And I was very thankful for the support they gave me when I was younger. Yeah, that's great. That means a it's lot. It's amazing yes. what a little difference uh -huh. it can make. Yeah, for sure. All right, so we're going to take a quick break one more time, and then we'll be ready to go on for the next 30, 35 minutes or so. We'll be right back with Dave Lyle on Racing Reach with Ham. Randy Mitchell of Temple Baptist Church in Statesville. Jesus Christ told his disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and let your light so shine before men. Salt and Light Radio seeks to glorify Jesus Christ while covering current and often controversial topics from a Bible-believing perspective that every listener needs to hear. Tune in Sunday afternoons from 12 to 12.30 for Salt and Light Radio on WAME. Salt and Light Radio is a ministry of Temple Baptist Church in Statesville. With more than 20,000 students, Iredell Statesville schools rank among the 20 largest school districts in North Carolina. Our teachers represent a wealth of knowledge, with the average teacher in our district having 15 years of teaching experience. Iredell Statesville Schools' innovative approach blends a one-to-one -one technology initiative with collaborative best practices and a hands-on approach to learning. In addition to traditional school settings, the district provides a wide range of exciting educational opportunities through our choice programs, specifically designed for unique student needs. No matter your age, your background, or your personal goals, there's a place for you in the Iredell Statesville Schools. All right, and we're back to Racing Roots with Ham. On DHAM, I am on YouTube. If you're listening on the radio, you want to see us here live in the Randy Marion studio, you can uh, go on to YouTube and check it out. And here we are. And we've got uh, Bryson in here with us, too. But I want to mention that – and we I also have um, – Christian. Christian Wilson in as uh, – he's coming in to, to help out and uh, visit with us today as well. But we want to mention our swimming pool and spa because it is so – stinking hot it right swim now weather for sure that you know if you want a swimming pool uh, i actually had someone ask me the other day did he knew that it was one of my sponsors or that he mentioned hey what's that sponsor you got there swimming pool and spa so if you need a swimming pool you need a pool liner put in you need your pool you need um, a pool boy yeah pool boy uh <laughs> he'll come out <laughs> neil johnson he makes a good pool boy neil johnson owns the swim in the n sounds for neil in sounds for neil and pool and spa and he will come out and be your personal pool boy you're and looking at me like you need to tell stuff. me that and i think chips actually think about doing that getting in that line of work too right <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking about getting in the pool yeah, getting in the pool getting yeah i understand so if you'd like to reach neil johnson over there you can give him a call at 704-727-2488 that is 704-727-2488 all so righty and that's get out of this jump in the pool and he'll help you with that. Yeah, there you go. And it's you 90 degrees in downtown Statesville right now. So it's, I thought right it now. said 95 yeah. earlier. And the sun, yeah. Well, the sun's going down, and yeah. it's still mm -hmm. hot. Still, though, that's, yeah. 
It's crazy. The humidity is ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Very that's, much so. That's what gets you. So you can find them on Facebook and Instagram as well. So check it out there, Dave. That's what you need is uh, go jump in your pool. Yeah. <laughs> I always had my own pool. <laughs> yeah. A cement pond. Yeah, a cement pond. Yeah. There you go. Whatever uh, works. So there is another question that came through. So Paul Rodriguez says, did Mr. Lyle ever race against anyone from Tasca Ford in East Providence, Rhode Island? They raced Fords in several different classes. That would be the grandfather of Bob Tasca III. He could swear, but he could be wrong, that Bob Tasca Sr. was called the father of the 428 Cobra jet. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I knew uh, Bob Tasca for, uh, personally. I met him in uh, 1962 when Ford built the lightweights. He came into Durham to pick his car up, and Paul Harvey, uh, the general manager, Bob Ford, introduced me to him. And uh, I met all his crew guys. Uh, John Healy and I are friends to this day. Uh, we were teammates. We didn't race against each other. And I don't recall that we ever uh, got got uh, set up where we had to take time trials against each other. Um, Bill Lawton, their driver, was also a friend of mine, a very talented guy. Uh, I knew him well in uh, 19, uh, let's see, 2000, no, 1992, they had a big nostalgia meet in Richmond, Virginia. And I went there, uh, Ronnie Sox was there, and uh, it was uh, like it is today. It was 100 degrees in the shade with 100% uh, humidity. Mm. And uh, my wife and I were walking through the pits. And I ran across Bob Task, and he come up, and he says, come on in our motorhome and cool off. Oh, how nice. So, yeah, he was, uh, you know, still remembering me. And uh, I very much enjoyed the hospitality. And then later on, uh, I ran into Ronnie Sox, and he did the same thing invited us and his coach uh, to cool off okay yeah they're, they're uh the comment i was telling you about earlier says from patricia lyle hall how Lyle hill yeah your sister right uh -huh, right yeah she said a great story dave and i give you a, a good grade on the writing too xo pat yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah pat's my big sister we've been uh, lifelong pals uh, she's been my alternate mother my alter ego uh very nice. Where's she at now? Where she live? Uh, she lives in Chesterfield Township. She's a widow. Uh, her husband passed away several years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, her and both of my sisters are widows. There were four of us originally, actually five of us. I had an infant sister that passed away when she was shortly after she was born, and I lost a brother uh, 19, let's see, 2006, I think it was, my brother Donald, a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. Now, she's still in Michigan, I assume? Beg your pardon? In Michigan? She's yeah, in Michigan? Yeah, it's just for township. It's a northern suburb of Michigan. Very nice. Oh, okay. So you were, were you around to see the Mount uh, St. Clement? Mount St. Clement. Uh, Mont, Mont Mount Clemens, Clemens. Is called, yeah. I don't know why I said St. That's the... That's the <laughs> Mount uh, Clemens was made famous uh, back in the 1890s and early 1900s. They had uh, mineral wells, you know, so they had mineral baths. Oh. I remember we used to drive through Bunk Clones on my way to my grandmother's place in Port Sand Lake, Michigan, and you'd have to roll the car windows on because that sulfur smell. You'd oh, get in the car, yeah. and my dad would look at my little sister, Wendy, and say, Wendy, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yes, there was a, uh, a NASCAR driver, Tracy Leslie, uh -huh. up that way, and I mentioned that to Chip because yeah. I believe that's right. where he lived. Yeah. Up there. There was a good bit of boat racing up that way, too, from yes. what I've seen. Uh -huh. All right, so then you, uh, so I was looking through some of the pictures here. If you want to see and learn more about Dave, you go to the racingroots.com, and then you can see over on the history where, where I have it now. But there's the, you were taking this 427 and turn it into the Boss 429. Right. When I built my 69 Mustang, and originally it was a Cobra Jet, like I say, I modified the spring towers like Bill Strop did in his comments, where you turned this. Spring tower is basically inside out. You put the spring on the outside of the engine compartment. So I could, actually I was thinking maybe I'd put a camera in it because we did, I did have a camera in my 65 Falcon for a while. And I was thinking maybe down the road at some place I'd probably want to put the camera back in again. And uh, so even though the car started out as a tunnel port, 
it, I had enough engine room that I could put the bus or the camera in it. And uh, like I say, Wayne Gap was my neighbor, and uh, we were not only racing buddies, but uh, we, we'd have dinner at each other's houses, so our conversation would always drift to, he was the principal engineer on the bus 429 engine development. And he was, uh, and of course I was a dyno tech at Ford Engineering, so I got to do the testing on the NASCAR engine and saw that they made about 50 more horsepower than the, than the wedge engine did. And uh, so he talked me into trying it out. And uh, so we took the uh, the picture you show, it's actually Wayne Gap is running the chain fall in mm -hmm. the picture. And uh, we were, uh, we'd remove the 427 tunnel port and put the Boss 429 in. Only problem is, as history has shown, uh, that ruined a perfectly good race car. Because mm, yeah. <laughs> it was 100 pounds heavier and five inches farther forward and uh, had a much heavier, had a 500 gram heavier rotating weight. And uh, Yep. So in, in 1993, well, you had a, there's another picture here. That you were, I'm looking at stuff to jog my memory uh -huh. on your deal, which you had. You were over pretty much all of the, the different types of racing going on at Roush Industries. In 1993, I was actually uh, I was actually the sales manager by that time. Okay. And uh, the thing that I was in charge of besides the, besides the sales of the company was the special vehicles. And we built uh, like their drag cars and the pace cars for uh, PPG. And uh, we did Cobras. We uh, got brand new uh, AC Cobra bodies from England and put engines in them and those kind of things. I had a very talented young man by the name of Steve Grebeck working. And uh, Steve went on to become a pretty famous drag racer on his own. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, was killed in an accident uh, a few years later. But anyway, uh, so that was just kind of a side deal. My main thrust was uh, increasing the sales of Roush, but mm -hmm. the special vehicles was a kind of a side thing. Okay, because I see there's, there's a picture of you with Mark Martin, Jack Roush, and oh. uh, and then Ted Musgrave and Mike Dingman. Mike Dingman, yes. That picture was taken at uh, Road Atlanta. Jack used to have every year uh, at the after the last, usually the last uh, race of the season was at uh, Atlanta. That was the season closer, and Jack would rent the uh, Road Atlanta track, which is the other side of Atlanta, and he would uh, take one of each of his race cars, a road race car, NASCAR car, a Trans Am car, and uh, some special vehicles, and we'd put right-hand seats in them, and we would invite all our special customers to this event. Mm. So it was called a ride and drive or fun days, Okay. and that's where that picture was taken. That was in 1994, I guess. Yeah, 1993, 94, somewhere along there. Yeah. Okay. And then you went on and did your IHRA pro stock uh -huh. with Chris Holbrook. Right. Yeah, Chris is my nephew. Oh, okay. And so that was in 2000. Right. Uh, Chris had been sponsored by a local uh, Lincoln Mercury dealer in, uh, in uh, Livonia, Stu Evans Lincoln Mercury, which is now defunct. And uh, they sponsored this Pro Stock in 1999. He won the IHRA Pro Stock Championship. And then the following year, Stu Evans dropped out of racing, so he had he lost his ride. So I had bought Chris's uh, top sportsman car that he won the top sportsman with, I think in 1995. I had bought that car from a subsequent owner to make it into a top sportsman, my own car. And uh, I had just acquired it, and uh, when Chris lost his ride, and uh, nobody stepped up to the plate to offer him another one, I went ahead and said, you know, let's let's take my top sportsman car, upgrade it to Pro Stock, and you know you can campaign it next year as the defending champion. So uh, I raced with him for the next year or two, uh, racing my uh, top sportsman car in Pro Stock. Chris went ahead and built uh, this seven. 800, 800 cubic inch boss engines with the help of John Cozzi and we and uh, then went on to get other sponsorship and was able to race the car himself. All right. So Paul Rodriguez says Ray Portier, Portier helps the kids drag race in Bradenton, Florida. Bradenton, Florida. So Paul's down there in Port St. Lucie area. 
but he originally was up in uh, was it New Hampshire, New Jersey, somewhere up that way. Sorry if I got that wrong because I didn't know you whenever you lived up there. Uh huh. Now you're in Port St. Lucie. What is that? What it says? Oh, I'm not. I don't remember where he was exactly. Just up yeah, north. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I was going to get with Bryson right quick, and uh, so he was out at Hickory this past weekend. Bryson, what yeah. was going on over there? So one of the biggest events that we had um, or will have this year is the uh, Jack Ingram Memorial. And a lot of race fans will know about Jack Ingram and, you know, being such a historic figure in in motor racing. But uh, this is the uh, first time. Last year they did a memorial race for Bob Isaac. um, But uh, this was the first running of this race. And it was was a big event. And, uh, you know, we have the Knots of Destruction at Hickory is, is sort of like a demolition derby thing. And that's usually a pretty big event and, you know, something that really sells out. Um, but I was um, really not shocked, but I was just happy to see all the race fans that came out for this event. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a lot of figures like Dale Jr. was there. Mm-hmm. Um, Harry Gant was there and, and a lot of track champions. Uh, the Houstons were there. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I saw them. Yeah. They've and been on the so, show, you know. They've yeah. been in here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it was just a good night for, for racing and racing history, you know, observing that. And uh, it was uh, just a cool event. Mm-hmm. So. Looking forward to it again for next year. All so, right, good. Did you, yeah. uh, did you tell anybody about racing roots? We did. I, I actually uh, had so our buddy uh, or my buddy Philip Goodman uh, was there, and, and we were talking. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's a photographer down there, and he was saying that he's really been keeping up with racing roots. And so um, I, I talked to several people uh, about the show and uh, uh, pointed some people our direction. So. Uh, it, like I said, it was a good good day for for racing and especially uh, grassroots racing up at Hickory. Mm-hmm. So. All right, yeah. very good. Cool hat out of oh yeah, your hat. Did you uh, show that hat to Harry Gant? Well, I didn't have it with me uh, um, I because I didn't want to. I'm, I'm very cautious of where I take it because it's a it's a real you know I'm, it's kind of authentic and so I I don't wear it out a lot. Um, but I was thinking, man, I should have brought it for uh, Harry to sign, but. Uh, you know, I, I get at the racetrack at 11 o'clock in the morning, and I pump fuel, and I was like, if I haul that thing around with me all day, I don't oh, want to mess it up. or be sweaty. You know, yeah, and mm-hmm. I don't – not that even that I wouldn't wear it. You know, even if I didn't wear it, I was still scared to – you know, sure. knowing my luck, I knew something could happen. So <laughs> um, I was hoping that, uh, you know, that wouldn't happen. But that's the reason I, I didn't bring yeah. it. But. Well, I just okay. want to know if you asked Harry to come on the show. Well, I've talked to Harry uh, a couple times about coming on, and you know he's called called in since then. But yeah. we will have to make a point to do that. So, uh, actually, saw his daughter in an event we had in Taylorsville mm-hmm. a few weeks ago. So we're working on it. So right. uh, hopefully, in the in the future, we can maybe get we something can have going. a skull reunion. Sounds like a good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And uh, Christian, what did you have uh, going on with the Dirt Vision? So. Um, I work at Dirt Vision. It's one thing I do other than uh, videography and uh, also do YouTube and content creating. But, yeah, this week, uh, Summer Nationals is starting for Dirt Vision, so there's going to be a lot of races going on through July with Summer Nationals. And um, I was going to say, I have a hat that's similar to yours, Bryson, um, but it's Tim Richmond. It has the white thing around there. But Mm -hmm. um, actually... uh, I was on Saturday. I went to a classic car cruise in, in with David. And, oh yeah. Uh, Bill Blair was there, and so Austin Petty was there, if I'm correct. Yeah, Austin was there. Yeah, and that was very fun. So, yeah. I hadn't seen Austin Petty in uh, gosh, uh, 25 years or so, I guess. I saw him when he's he's about the age of his dad. Whenever I saw his, where him last, whatever, something like I got that totally backwards, but. Yeah, it's Kyle, his dad. Very yes. Dexterous. Yep. He's grown. He's a grown boy. He's forty years old now. Wow! I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" Yeah. <laughs> he was wearing. A, I, sorry, go ahead. My, no, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> he was wearing a North Wilkesboro Speedway shirt, which yeah. Um, they they started racing or not racing, but they started uh, practicing there a, a week and or two weeks ago. Um, Bobby Labonte was out there, if I'm correct, and I know Harry Gant visited there um, about a month ago when they made the announcement. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. really cool to see that. North Wilkesboro Speedway, they're starting racing back there again. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Dave, you ever get involved in any of the uh, Wilkesboro Speedway stuff? Have you been there? I, I have never been there, Okay. No. Well, you're a little bit I'm far very, north. I'm very there. interested in it, though. Yeah, okay. I'm very interested in NASCAR history because I actually started out wanting to be an old track driver. 
Oh, okay. It's just that uh, the, the events of my life kind of led me into drag racing. Yeah. But uh, I, I spent uh, the summer of 1960, 1956 touring with uh, what was then called Mark, M-A-R-C, which eventually became ARCA. So I spent oh. that summer traveling with a uh, ARCA uh, tour uh, guys. Okay. And uh, what was your role? I was a crew guy. I was a tire changer and uh, gopher, you know, yeah, gas right. man, so forth. Mm -hmm. We didn't. It wasn't a, as organized as it is today. Uh, we only had uh, three people in the crew, plus a driver. So, yeah. so you your did role just wasn't as well defined as it is today in NASCAR. Yeah. Well, and you've done a little bit, a lot of everything. It yeah, sounds I like. have. Even boat racing. Gosh. <laughs> Even the boat racing, yeah. St. Yeah. Clair, Lake St. Clair, what is it up there? Lake St. Clair, that's a big one. Okay. But I worked for Crusader Marine Engines uh, in 1960, 61, and uh, they were a manufacturer of marine engines. And uh, their owner of that company was Cal Canal, who was, uh, whose parents owned a Cadillac dealership and Hazel Park Racetrack. So uh, they sponsored uh, unlimited hydroplanes for a while. <laughs> Oh. And we used to hang out at the big Detroit uh, uh, night spot called the Rooster Tail, which is famous, you know, for uh, boat racing. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I used to go to the boat races every, you know, down in the Detroit River, the unlimited hydroplanes. Plus, uh, I worked in the uh, engineering lab at Crusader, so we did the special engines that were built for customers that were sponsored for uh, race engines. Okay. And uh, we would convert Corvette engines to our regular Chevrolet. We would dress them up like our regular Chevrolet bread and butter marine engines, but they'd be the Corvette engine, you know, for our special customers. Yeah. That's a, the first boat race I went to was up all in the Detroit River. Uh huh. So, That's something I haven't done. Yeah. It, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, fact, there. Uh, we yeah. used to test uh, on Lake Oakland in the winter, uh, well, in the fall, in October, because there wouldn't be any people out there, you know, uh, pleasure boating. We'd have the lake to ourselves. So one time we were out there testing a Sentry, which was a wooden speedboat, 17 foot. And uh, Sentry used to buy Cadillac engines from us, but we were trying to sh uh, convince them to buy the the Chevrolet small block. So in this case, we had taken a 327 Chevy Corvette engine and marinized it and uh, put it in this 17-foot wooden boat. Anyway, we're going across the lake wide open throttle, and uh, normally on the dyno, we would turn the distributor, find the best timing, but since we're on the lake, my, my boss was a, a manager. He's uh, running a boat, and, and I'm bent over with the distributor wrench, and I'm, I'm cranking the distributor, and he's watching the tack. Oh. And all of a sudden, I noticed, I heard the engine rev up, and I noticed the sky was oh. down and the water was up. Oh man! <laughs> oh, no. We had he was looking back over his shoulder talking to me and he started in the, a gradual turn out realizing it. Mm. We were probably running 60 mile an hour and we came across our wake and the boat flipped you know mm -hmm. threw us out. Wow! So we got thrown in the lake at, in October. Gosh! Very nice. And that was nice a, and chilly. Was a shocking experience hitting <laughs> that cold water. Yeah, Boy. I bet. Had a Titanic experience. Yeah. Well. And, and you're in the engine <laughs> hole trying to move the distributor. Yeah, right. And all of a sudden... I never did find the distributor wrench. <laughs> <laughs> I bet not. So is that place called Rooster Tail because of the rooster tail yeah, coming yeah, out? Yeah, that, that's why it was called a rooster tail, because of yeah. rooster tail from the big unlimited boats. Mm. I, I guys telling a story one time, Cal Canal, the owner of Crusader, went down to the river after getting off work. And he was going to see how they're doing on this race boat. And he saw the driver was standing in the water waist deep. And he said, Fred, what the, where the hell is my boat? And Fred says, I'm standing on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you just thought I could walk on water. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, what else have you done? I mean, we're just learning all kinds of stuff about Dave. <laughs> well, uh, never did much flying. Uh, although I wanted to, but yeah. you can only get so many things in one life. Uh, car racing, boat racing, uh, oval track racing, drag racing. Uh, well, I was in drag racing for 50 years from 1957 is uh, first time down a drag strip, and my last time was 2006 on my 66th birthday. Very nice. Mm. So, uh, 
I survived 50 years of racing. Yeah, that's <laughs> impressive in itself. Yeah. Did right. you start out racing your go-kart? Well, I started out racing my go-kart before I, uh, you know, was old enough to drive. Uh, like I said, my dad bought me a Briggs & Stratton engine, so I'd leave the lawn tractor alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to race up and down the street all the time. And uh, the, the, uh, the local, uh, the city father of East Detroit were so frustrated with the local businessmen complaining about us, <laughs> putting skid marks all over the parking lot, chasing their customers away, that they took the ice skating rink where they had the winter where they would add a berm built up to flood the field. They went out there with a grader and just made it a track. So we had about an eighth of mile oval that the city fathers did for us. And Very nice. I'd go out there with a five gallon gas can and do laps until I was so tired I couldn't lift myself out of the car. Mm. There you go. So I really wanted to be an oval track driver. Wow. I want to say hey to my cousin Jim. He's tuned in. Jim. That's what I was getting ready to say. Hey, he, James McCorkle. Yeah, he, he worked at home in a Moody for a little while. I'm not sure exactly what he did there, but he, he worked there. I'm not sure how many years he was there. But anyway, he lived down there in Charlotte, about where I grew up. Down Where'd the street from Home and Moody. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. but I grew up. Did you grow up down beside Home and Moody? I grew up in Charlotte, west side. All right. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, okay. I met John Holman in 1961 when I was at Bob Ford. Oh, yeah. So did you ever meet uh, Ralph Moody? I never met Ralph Moody, but I've seen him several times when he would come up to Nostalgia Meets. And I uh, I just missed seeing him at uh, when he went to DeLand for the Winter Nationals when I was racing NASCAR drag racing. I just missed him at the at the Speedway. We stopped at the Speedway and I uh, just missed him. And you also, and it's, that's something I learned from you that I didn't realize they raced over. It's DeLand Airport right, at the DeLand time. DeLand Airport, yeah. Because our friends uh, Scott and Jenna live down there in Deland. Scott's tuned in. Uh -huh. Yeah, hey Scott. And uh, another one is uh, Smoky Eunuch. Yeah, Smoky Eunuch. Uh, I miss Smoky Eunuch in uh, this time in 1967. Uh, we had built a ferry lane. Uh, Holman Moody shipped us a body in white, uh, and we'd build a drag car out of it. It was called a 90 Day Wonder. It was in several Hot Rod magazine articles. And uh, we spent so much time building a car from scratch and using a tube chassis and all that kind of stuff that we just took the powertrain out of my Falcon. So uh, we took the powertrain, the transmission, the differential, and the dry shaft and just put it in the uh, fur lane, went to the Daytona. On the first pass, I noted <laughs> it had a pretty good drive, drive line vibration. Well, the dry shaft was a little too short. Although it engaged in the spline, I guess it didn't have enough support in the tail housing bushing. So we took the dry shaft out and, and asked everybody where could we get a dry shaft made. And everybody said, go over to Smokey Shop. He'll make you one. Mm. So sure enough, we went to Smokey Unix Shop in D Daytona. And he made us a dry shaft while we waited. That's cool. Yeah, speaking of that, me and Scott, or speaking of Scott, we, were, we went over to where the shop was located and right. I did some video. We walked around and looked to see what was left, but there's not yeah. a whole lot left of it no. after it burned. I went back a couple of years ago on vacation and uh, we stayed in near one of the lakes there in the local area and I took my family into Daytona just for uh, sightseeing and uh, I drove around and I was able to find that it was just a vacant lot though at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought maybe if I could find it, I'd bring back memories. When, sure. Uh, People that were uh, in NASCAR today would be surprised at how crude they used to do it, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Smoky Shop was kind of a ramshackle-looking uh, place, like two or three different buildings had been put together with, you know, connecting them together and all the different roof heights and different outside construction. And uh, he had it pretty much organized, but like his shelves would be a cement block with a two by six and a cement block and a two by six. That's, yeah. that's what he used for shelves. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you couldn't deny his talent and the equipment that he had there. He made that dry shaft for us and nothing flat. Oh yeah. That's for sure. That's why I got to meet him one time, but uh -huh. I didn't ever get to really hang around him. I love to talk to him. He was a character. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. James McCorkle says he worked in the fab shop with Luigi. Okay. Yeah, I don't know uh, who Luigi was, though, but we'll have to we'll pass that along to maybe your dad would know. You know, Chip knows. Was. No, I, I, I would like Dave to tell his famous story about his 67 Fairlane when you went gas racing with it the one time. 
Your 67 Fairlane that you went yeah. gas racing. Uh, yeah, give me a, a clue. You, you were coming home from a meet. and you Oh, needed... okay. Yeah. Uh, we were on the NASCAR circuit, and uh, there was a meet in Union Grove, Wisconsin. So uh, we showed up there Sunday morning, and sure enough, it rained all the way up there, and we got to the track, and the promoter says, sorry, we're going to we're rained out. Well, I thought, it's a wasted weekend. Uh, I don't remember if we got tow money or not. If we did, it wasn't very much, maybe $100. But uh, Union Grove, Wisconsin was good six, seven hour tow from Detroit where I lived. So anyway, on the way back, uh, we get down in southern part of Illinois and I saw all these race cars going by, you know, being towed. So I thought, well, we just pull them behind them and see where they go. Mm -hmm. Must be going to a race somewhere. So sure enough, we pull in this track and uh, ask what's going on here. He says, well, we're having a gas funny car meet. Uh, that was popular back in the 60s because uh, NHRA had outlawed nitromethane. Oh. So uh, they were, the, the funny cars, all their wheelbase with injected engines and so forth, were running on gasoline. So my fair lane, uh, it was a NASCAR fair lane, so it, was, it looked perfectly stocked to the eye. The engine was in the right place. The wheels were in the right place. Uh, the body was completely stocked on the outside looking. It just had it. It was uh, only weighed 2,600 pounds. Mm -hmm. It had a you know, tube, uh, square tubing of ch uh, steel chassis, and it had a 427 tunnel port in it, which made at the time probably 650 horsepower. So anyway, I said, well, if I can at least qualify for the show, I'll get first round loser money, which <laughs> you know would pay for the gas going back home and buy us buy us a chicken dinner. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So. <laughs> Uh, we signed up, and uh, as it turned out, I made my first run, and I was number one qualifier, you know, a low 10-second run. So uh, we went on to win the race and uh, won the prize, and a guy came up to me sight unseen and says, how much you want for the car? And I thought, well, the most ridiculous thing I can think of is $5,000. So I said, 5000 bucks. He said, I'll buy it. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. There you go. I said, well, I got a race with it next week, so I'll tell you what, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll bring it back in two weeks. He said, only if you promise me it's going to be the same car and the same engine and the same everything that you won't touch it. I said, you go put your marks on the engine, you know, crawl over the car, mark everything you want, and I guarantee you that's what will be in the car when I bring it back, mm. and it'll be fresh. So sure enough, I came back and he paid me with pennies. <laughs> but he had the, in banks, you know, in uh, bank bags. Really? But he had the local uh, newspapers out there taking pictures of it, and I had yeah. a wheelbarrow full of pennies. <laughs> oh, is that what that was about? Okay. Yes. I was going to say, it sounds like you, you got some of your ideas. Maybe that was something y'all did back then, but it sounded like Jack Roush was doing a good bit of that too. Buying cars and. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you did what you had to do. We were always. Well, ever since I started racing uh, for money, you always had to have at least two cars because you're always breaking one or, or uh, you think of something you wanted to try. So, uh, you know, you do updates to the next car. So mm -hmm. yeah. what I did every year, when I get the next year's car, uh, back then I was sponsored by Ford. I could get new cars for a dollar. When I get my next one, I'd keep the last one. Oh. <laughs> so... Uh, when I sold the Fairlane, that's when I went back to Ford, and I said I need another car, and that's when I got the lightweight Mustang. Mm. So, which one would you like to have back right now? I probably my '69. That's the one that's the most famous. Okay. I sold it for five thousand dollars in uh, 1971, January 1971, and the guy that bought it kept it for 30 years. I don't know what he sold it for, but I understand it was a hundred thousand. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And I think today it went for half a million. Wow. Because it was the first production boss for 29 off the assembly line. Oh. And there's a picture of it, you know, with uh, Fran Hernandez and some other Ford execs next to this black boss 429 Mustang. Hmm. Well, it was a pilot car, so it was not saleable. So Ford had it at the experimental garage. So when it came time for me to get my next dollar car, they said, take that one. Mm. So. <laughs> That's the one I took, yeah. and it was a pre-production. It was the first Boss 429. Yeah. And the car was actually being more famous than I was. <laughs> wow. So. That's awesome. I was, uh, I was born in January of 71, uh -huh. okay. by the way. Just a side note. Not oh, that it matters. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Bill Lowe does have a question. He says, did Mr. Lyle ever have any contact with Ed I 
Eskadarian, who is now hundred years old. Eskadarian. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. hard. I met I met Esk- at Eskadarian, and I uh, tried one of his camshafts in our '63 Ford. Uh, George DeLorean was a personal friend of mine. George DeLorean's brother, John DeLorean, is the guy that started DeLorean Motor Car Company. Uh-huh. And uh, Pontiac, Pontiac had a lot of uh, work with Eskadarian. And George whispered in my ear one time, you got to try the Esky Cam. So at the tail end of 63, they had, uh, Bob Ford had sold my car because it was on their, uh, it was on their inventory and they had to get rid of it and they had a buyer. So uh, they sold the, the yellow and black 63 lightweight that I was driving and they gave me the black car that Len, Len Richter had been driving. And uh, so I built a fresh high riser engine and I, and I, I, I took George DeLorean's advice and I got an es- Escadarian 505 camshaft and put in that car. We went out to Detroit Dragway that next weekend, and I was running some 1170s, 123 mile an hour times. I was as fast with that car as they were with the Thunderbolts. Oh, so I was a believer in Escadarian cams. <laughs> yep, they're a popular cam. That's for yes. sure. Been around a while. Uh, T- Chip, camera's on you now, if you don't mind. But I want to ask you a question. How do you, how did you get to know Dave, and what is your Dave stories? Well. I guess I've been practicing thinking how I was going to ask, answer this question. There you and go. Dave and I were definitely in Jack's principal office a lot for being in trouble. Okay. That's all I can say. That would be an understatement. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I can say that I was very fortunate to come through the engineering side at Roush. A lot of people don't realize that up in the Livonia area, um, the racing was only part of what the co- company was all about. Uh, a lot of it was supporting uh, future products and projects for the, man, um, the manufacturers, Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, all of the above. That's the side that I was on. But every now and then, they knew that I knew I had come from a racing background, from uh, experience, mm-hmm. and they dragged me over to the other side for a couple of different projects. Well, Dave would always be around him. Uh, one of the first things probably where I met him was, uh, I was going to say it was either uh, Storm and Norman's car, where we did the fuel injected conversion over um, uh, getting away from um, carburetors. Yeah, well, carburetors and the Ford electronics and going to the standalone. I guess I got to plug my buddy, John Meany. Right. We went to the DFI system back then. Um, Dave was kind of orchestrated that whole program for everybody, made sure that it was all you know, put together from soup to nuts. And um, did some other things too. We did the Boss 604 Mustang together. Also, the pace car, that's where you had to do the DFI. We uh, right. <clears throat> sold PPG pace car, and I, I designed this intake manifold that was kind of like uh, the Chevrolet Ramjet. It had a side throttle body on top of the plenum. But we, <coughs> the uh, engineers at Ford said we couldn't, uh, couldn't use the Ford system. So it was called the uh, F1 Electronics at the yeah. time. That was. Pro- pro- uh, it was used only for the road race cars, uh, the IMSA cars and whatnot, and they didn't want to, they didn't see the um, validity of wasting their time putting it on just this one little project car. So they said no. So once again, we had to go out and get an, uh, a DFI unit, and uh, we put it on there, and act- actually what allowed the thing to run, because uh, at the time, the only way you could get a Ford Electronics the Ford to do something is that you had to basically trick it. You had to lie to it. You couldn't actually take control of it and say, I want this timing, I want this amount of fuel, I want this, I want that. You actually had to go in and trick it and do little uh, emulator uh, board extensions with tr- uh, chips in them. And um, yeah, well, that was another one that we did as well. So, Chip and I's friendship was... Uh... <clears throat> crossed some cultural lines at Roush. So we were uh, forbidden for, to associate with each other for exactly. a while. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Wow. yeah. We were in jail. Yeah, we were in jail, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good. That's interesting. So how many years did you work over there? I was there from uh, 89 till um, 02. Um, I started out in doing development for um, engines and production programs and so on and so forth. And I was very fortunate enough to wind up being um, a manager of chassis and suspension engineering before I left there. Okay. Um, Dave left the company at the time and uh, drug me over to along with him and 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got in trouble at that place too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and now you're just getting trouble at your own place. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's all good, right? Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, Dave has definitely been a mentor of mine. Absolutely. Yeah. Vice cool. versa. So. Yeah. <clears throat> we all seem to work very well together. Yeah. I think uh, I have a mutual respect for him, and I think he does for I, and uh, that works well together. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. All right, good. Did you need to plug anybody, your your, your brother and your brother-in-law? Uh, Tom Gen, you, you got to plug him. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Tom's a man. Tom Tom's a he's a legend, and now he's uh, he retired, but then he got busier. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's kind of the way it goes, I guess. Um, he come down, you know, with, with Roush whenever they merged uh, Roush Yates engines, and then Tom come in there, and immediately they put him in there working with me, and so we were you know, kind of like learning each other's ways of doing things. But, you know, I think we're like fitting rod bearings and, and things like that. But uh, we, we spent a lot of time together. And then eventually they put him in charge of like the R&D program, mm-hmm. which was very good. Yeah. Um, he's always been great. We always got along good. We laughed a lot. And uh, whenever he tried to be, you know, he could be real tough. Oh, yeah, tough. A lot of times. Tough. And, then I, yeah. and then I would just kind of. You know, I would respect him always, never disrespected him, but yeah. but I'd always kind of find a way to lighten him up a little bit, and I think we we just got along good that way. Yeah, so. I always tell him he needs to take a and relax a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Just relax, Tom. You know, I was a, I was a foreman at right. the Ford yes. Roost plant in my twenties. Yeah. And uh, one thing I learned was a cultural shock in the first place growing up in East Detroit uh, to go to the Ford Roost plant, but one thing I learned in that was. Don't don't judge a book by its cover. You know, there's room in uh, there's room in my life for different kinds of people who talk different, who look different, who act different. If they have something that you can respect them for, and you respect them for what they can do, and not what they look like or how they talk or anything else. So, mm. yeah, that's for sure. Especially in racing, you know, because right. you get in racing and you, you definitely have that in common. Yeah. I've made a lot of lifelong friends in racing because I respected, I knew, I like when I met Ronnie Sox and, and people like Hubert Platt and other people, I, I understand we were already uh, fairly well known by our, our own names by the time we met them, but I knew the sacrifice that they had gone through to get there and the skills that they had to learn to get to that level. Mm-hmm. So you respect a person for that and uh, you just become friends, you don't. They don't have to. They don't have to prove themselves to you because you know what they are and who they are and what they can do. Absolutely, that's very well put. Yeah, that's good to, for everybody to hear and to know about life in general too. Remember that Bryson? Yes. Young Bryson, just 16 yeah. years young, and I believe Christian over here is about 21. So, you guys just take take all this in and use it the rest of your life for free. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, people that I have mentioned, yeah. like uh, the salesman or Bob Ford, Jack Gray, yeah. uh, a very instrumental person, uh, taught me, you know, to think, in, like in racing, to think about the business side of racing. That uh, he did it as an investment. He invested his time and his money. He got to do something he liked. He it still made him uh, help to make a living. So uh, that, uh, you know, I learned from Jack and. Uh, uh, I looked at racing from that point on as an investment of time and money, and you have to have a return back. So uh, don't waste your time with things that don't return. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's great, too. That's another one. Write that down. Yeah. Remember Still it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see here. Bill O says, thanks for taking my question. Another great show. Appreciate you for – thank you for tuning in. And for everybody else that's tuned in this evening and uh, – Thank y'all. Uh, let's see here. Okay. And for Tracy, for your help, of course, as always. Glad you could come back this week. Yes. I think you missed last week. I had to work. And uh, if y'all are just tuning in, you can tell her happy birthday if you'd like. Oh, yeah. And uh, don't forget to get her a present. Send her some yeah. money or whatever. Right. You know, those kinds of things count. <laughs> Women like, uh, they like money instead of flowers. Uh, this this woman. I'm not a big flower girl. Yeah. Well, you could take the money and buy flowers if you really want to. Yeah. Or, you know, you could buy something that's really useful. That's so right. Buy, your, buy something for your husband to go and make more money with. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I got my wife signed up to go along with my racing as I handed her the money. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So, speaking oh, of that, what would tough. you say is your best 
one memory of your years in racing? What would be the the one memory that sticks out that is well, your it would favorite? be a toss-up between the time uh, with Jack Gray's car. I won the uh, Super Stock Championship, uh, called a Tri-State Championship in Central Michigan Dragway in 1961. I defeated Troy Rutman's 409 Chevy in the final, and he protested me for a legal ballast. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to race him again. So I protested him, and sure enough, he had legal ballast also. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. So anyway, they, they emptied our trunks, and we had to rerun it. And the second time, I beat him worse than the first. All right. Uh, I think that was the first big money meet that I won, other than some match racing money. It would either be that or else the time I talked about in 69, after I set the first nine-second run at the AHRA Spring Nationals, the following weekend I went to Evansville, Indiana, and uh, it was Jerry Haas. I, I couldn't remember his name. It was the car that I beat in the uh, final. Jerry Haas went on to be a famous chassis builder. But anyway, that <clears throat> and, uh, first I set the first nine-second run, then the following week I won that meet it. Evansville, Indiana. The following week, I went to uh, Gary, Indiana, and they won the UDRA uh, Spring Nationals mm. in, in Pro Stock. Well, they call it Heads Up Super Stock back in those days. So I think that, that three week period uh, was like a dream come true. Sure. I just couldn't do nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gosh, I can imagine. Yeah. How awesome was that? So, was there one person that you wished you had have raced against that you didn't get the opportunity to race against? I'd uh, like to race against Grumpy again with my tunnel port. <laughs> oh, yes. After I'd spent a year working on it, though, like I did to boss. Yeah. Because uh, my next, I raced uh, Grumpy in the Spring Nationals, and I red-lighted against them. And then uh, next time we raced was at the uh, Super Stock Nationals in 1969, where I debuted at the boss for 29. Mm. And uh, I ran him in one of the rounds, but... Because of the high bob weight uh, and the four nine inch rear end had not been developed at that point, I broke a rear end on every run. I never made a full full mm. pass the whole weekend. Mm. Mm. And then I ran him the following week at Detroit Dragway in a match race, and uh, I broke a heim joint on my uh, traction bar and mm. uh, lost to him again. Oh no! But uh, I would like to run him again when I got my tunnel. With, you know, after spending a year on my tunnel port development. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, Brian sense. Did you read that question? Mm, I don't know if I did. Who would have been your toughest competitor? Uh, Ronnie Sox. I beat Ronnie Sox in our super stock cars with my Cobra Jet against his uh, Plymouth Satellite, but I could never beat him in pro stock. And one time at the super stock nationals the following year, they had what they call uh, first round loser or fastest loser. So uh, Ronnie beat me, I think, in the quarterfinals. But uh, an, another car had broke, so what they did, they would take the fastest loser from the previous round and bring him back because they don't want anybody making any buy runs. So here I go back mm. in the stage lane next to Ronnie. He looks at me, how many times I got to beat you? <laughs> <laughs> Sit till I can win. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie was a good friend, and uh, uh, I miss him dearly. Mm. Good stuff. You got anything uh, you want to say by to your uh, say hey to your family or? Well, I want to say hi to my family and uh, my friends back in uh, Michigan, and uh, I sure miss you guys. I love the weather down in North Carolina, but I sure miss my family. And I hope you're all having all well and having a good time. And I hope y'all enjoyed the show. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed the show. Yeah, I sure enjoyed doing it. Good. I'm we glad. We enjoyed I'm having so glad. you on. All right. Yep. I feel like we, we've made a, a new friend, too. We're going to, you know, start coming over and, and seeing you more often. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, okay. like, Thanksgiving. Do you cook really good? Or? Sure, yeah, I do. I, I cook pretty Maybe good. Some, uh, all right. You have Not a, you many have men a, cook very good. Hold on. Did you say you had a swimming pool? No, I don't have a swimming pool. Can you get one? <laughs> well, uh, Cape Brown, I'm staying that has a pool, but uh, we'll have to, it's pretty crowded. We'll, we'll be your we'll Lake Norman. Yeah. Oh, Lake Norman. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, we need Chip to build a pool. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, Chip. Yeah, he's, he's got, got a, the room. Chip's got a yard. <laughs> there you go. He does. He's got a real nice place yeah. for it. I'll come over and, and uh, 
keep it mowed down and, yeah. and uh, weeded around. I won't charge any extra for weed eating around a pool. I'll show them how to maintain <laughs> How's that. I'll, I'll, be his yeah. pool, I'll be his pool boy. Here, Here you go. go. <laughs> his own private pool boy. I thought we had a pool boy. <laughs> oh, oh, swimming pool and spa. Yeah, I, was yeah. going, I was about to say, we know a guy for that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we'll do that. All right, Neil, we need a hookup. All right, so we'll work on that. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and sell. We just sold a pool tonight. Can you there believe you that? <laughs> We're still working yeah, on a hot right, tub. Yeah. Chip. <laughs> oh, you got to have a hot tub, too. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Big, yeah. We're, we're working on the hot tub. That's something that's, uh, yeah, we talked about it. And then COVID hit, and then the hot tubs went out of stock. Yeah. I guess they got sick, too. But anyway, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> People making know. them got sick. Yeah, that's what it was. We're announcing tonight a new hot tub shortage. <laughs> hot tub shortage. Yes. Let's hope it's on the rise. <laughs> Just kidding. Yes. Neil Johnson can hook you up with that. Uh, Swimming pool and spa. Right. Yep. All right. He's, he, he's, he needs to get a new side business. Pool Boys. Yeah. Cabana Boys. Oh, yeah. There you go. Pool there Boys go, Incorporated. My sister Wendy had a hot tub, and I showed her you can dive into a hot tub. <laughs> oh. <laughs> very carefully. Yes. Yeah, very carefully. Oh, yes. All right. So we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Dickie Dennis says, thanks for the stories. Terrific show tonight. Yeah. They, that was terrific, man. Thank you so thank much you. for all your stories. Yeah. and I want to thank Jack for uh, taking part and yes. uh, for all the good things he said. Mm -hmm. Very nice call in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. That was great. And uh, Kathy, for uh, he, uh, called her. She called me, his secretary up in Michigan. Uh huh. Okay. And so she yeah. uh, she lined it up with him, and and all good. Okay. Yeah, Made right. it happen. Yeah. So Thank you, dear. Of course. Help. Yeah. Her name yes, is uh, her last name spelled R A U S C H or something. Right. Ra Roush, not Roush. Yeah. Roush. You know. Roush. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jack Thanks. has a daughter that's active in the company. Hmm. Uh, Susan. Okay. Yep, and his son, is his son involved in it too? Or He was racing a little bit too, right? Yeah, now. he was racing. I don't know if he's ever involved in a co oh, company. Yeah, gotcha. I never got to know him much. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, yep. It has been. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in on YouTube. And Brian Sensel says, thanks, gang. Great show. Thank you for that. And hit the um, thumbs up if you don't mind hitting the thumbs up. Just tell YouTube that you okay. liked it. Subscribe, hit that bell notification. If you'd like. And uh, also, if you want to find out more about Dave, I've got the, I did the write-up on my racingroots.com. So you can see it. You can go on there. You won't see any ads or any of that kind of stuff pop up. Okay. Just a good information, good history about Very racing. Very good. Yes. All right. Well, uh, I don't necessarily have a – I do have a guest lined up for next week, but I'm just going to wait and make sure because, you know, it's a lot to keep up with. A it's bunch tentative. Of yeah, that kind of stuff. So, and uh, we'll announce that. You just check out on Facebook, Racing Roots with ham and uh you'll keep up to date on all that so y'all have a great week and we'll see you next week real country 550 and 92.9 wame statesville real country performing live on the piedmont healthcare clock tower stage on real country 550 and 92.9 wame